Hello, welcome to my talk about software visualization and why I think it has some unused potential. A um, couple of words about me. My name is Eberhard. I'm from Salzburg and um, I originally became software engineer because I wanted to develop games. But during my undergrad, um, I got interested into human-computer interaction. Then I did some internships in the Google Chrome team where I worked on uh, some developer tooling stuff and so I got into developer tooling. And during my time at Google, I was um, working on Chrome and Chrome is a massively big code base. And um, I spent a lot of time reading and understanding code and I sort of um, had the impression that it, we, we don't do it the most efficient way yet. Um, so I got interested into software visualization. I did a master's degree and um, uh, started working on a tool named uh, Source Trail. And uh, I get to that later. But um, now um, I want to start my talk with a um, quote from Stefan Diel, who wrote a book on software visualization. And he um, observed that programmers tend to adapt to the level of representation provided by the computer instead of adapting the computer's representations to their perceptive abilities. And um, so as especially the, the things in bold I want to get into and I really want to make you understand what he, what he means by that. So, okay, let's go into it. Um, so story usually starts with uh, some developer who starts implementing code. And then later on, other developers uh, need to read and understand what he wrote. And, a lot of times the one on the left ends up on the right at some, at some point because, you know, it's, he wrote it some time <laughs> ago. And um, so we sort of know that the reading part is um, actually the one that is uh, done more often. Like Robert Martin wrote in Clean Code that the ratio of reading and writing is about 10 to 1. And we don't have like real certain numbers, we but we sort of agree on um, 50 to 70 percent of uh, professional developers' uh, time is actually spent on reading and understanding. Um, and we have 20 million software developers in the world, around 4 million are C, C++ developers. So if we can make reading and understanding um, <coughs> more efficient, we can, s we can gain a lot of productivity. And so, um, uh, yes, the, the reading part is um, like it takes up the majority. And um, so we uh, have some uh, strategies on how to deal with that. And the usual advice is, you know, write tests, write documentation, and um, overall um, write good code in the first place. But um, so all of these advices is great and you should follow that. But as, as a developer who um, comes <laughs> to a project um, that's already there, there's not a lot you can do. Like you, you just have to deal with the situation. And um, so, why, why is it, um, what, what's the problem with reading source code? Um, the thing is, source code is sort of an expression of um, a developer thinks if he wants to implement some logic and he expresses it. And this expression is code. And code is what the computer understands. And um, that's why it's called code, it's an encoding. And then developers who want to read and understand it, they need to reverse that and decode. Um, that thing. And so if we look at what source code really is, it is um, it's textual data. There's uh, different kinds of data. There's like numerical data, there's um, temporal data, map data. Um, but source code is textual data and it has a lot of uh, information in it. Like if you just change one symbol in there, chances are really good that you break it. And if you're reading it, like you, you have to be careful to like read into every <laughs> single line and symbol to sort of uh, figure out what it does. And when you read it, you're like, every developer has some different strategy. Maybe you go from top to bottom or you like, um, you know, see there's a class and then you um, look at which methods exist and, and then you sort of piece it together in your head. You read some, some name, you keep it in your mind, you need to figure out what data type it is. And um, so you constantly, like your eyes, they constantly jump around and um, you build up this model inside your head. And um, we do some things to make this easier for us, <coughs> like we uh, use syntax highlighting and um, white spacing and naming conventions like, you know, upper casing, camel casing, and that stuff to, to sort of put meaning into, into this text. And, um, but this, this whole process is not really the best way for our minds. 
And so the question is, what is, what is the best way? And uh, let's take a look at uh, data visualization. And data visualization uses um, visual variables to encode information. So there's these, uh, there's position, size, and it's really easy for us to look at each row and see what's the difference between the elements. Like, you know, it has a different color, it has a different shape. It's really easy. And so um, this is actually my most important slide. Um, because this um, information is processed immediately. So if you look at each group, you, uh, you don't even need to think about it. You already know what the, what the outlier is. This is, you know, it's like, it's like a, it's a super fast path. It's like a const expression compiled into, into your brain. And if we make use of that, then, you know, we can convey information much faster. Um, and then there's the principles of grouping, which is also sort of how we, um, <coughs> um, with our visual perception, identify which things belong together. So in the proximity example, you don't see nine circles, you see three columns of three circles. And with the enclosure, the one that has the rect around them, they belong together. And for continuation, you don't see a bunch of uh, small lines. You see like two continuous lines crossing each other. And so this is really sort of the instruction set of our visual perception. And if we can use that in visualization, then um, it's sort of the information conveys itself. So here's some example. This is a bar chart. Everyone knows how it works. Um, but let's take a look at what, um, how it makes use of these tools. Um, so it uses different position for each um, year. <coughs> so um, you know, from left to right, you have the table entries, the rows, and then it uses um, size to convey the, the, the number, and it uses different colors to show uh, which, um, which is the first and the second column. And then it uses proximity to, give, uh, to put together the two numbers that are in the same row. And now as a little exercise, um, just look at the table and try to figure out in which, um, in which rows, in which years, the first column was bigger than the second. And if you do that, you, you need to go through every line and sort of um, remember the ones that matched. And it's, it's a lot harder than just looking at the visualization where it's really clear. It's where the, the brighter ones are larger. So um, there's um, now a second sample. Um, so this one's not really visualization, but you can see here that we use some principles in formatting code. Um, for the computer, both like the left and the right is, is the same. Computer doesn't care. So we do it for ourselves. And we, um, so we use color to sort of uh, differentiate different um, elements like keywords and types. And then we use uh, indentation, which is position, to show um, um, like uh, nesting. And then we use some um, white space, empty lines, to group together things that um, belong to the same thing. And um, so um, there's actually a, a limit to color as well. So you can, you can differentiate um, and categorize around 12 different colors. So if you're syntax highlighting, you can only do as much as that. Um, okay, and now we see how that works. Now let's take a look at software visualization. So of course, um, lots of uh, people had already uh, tried to come up with visualizations and um, Stefan, Stefan Diel wrote this book, Software Visualization, where he sort of put together all existing approaches and he categorized them um, three different main uh, fields. <coughs> so there's a uh, structure visualization, which um, it, it takes the code as data. So um, it does static analysis and figures out which classes, functions, methods exist, and then uh, visualizes that. Then behavior visualization is if you take data from the execution of the code. And um, so during runtime, dynamic analysis, and the last one, evolution visualization, takes the history so the, the version control data and um, does visualization on that. And um, let's, uh, let's look at some uh, examples for them. 
Um, first, um, a couple words about UML, because um, if you talk about software visualization, you, oh, UML will always come up. Um, UML was um, standardized in 1997, and it, um, it uses mostly a graph visualization. So it, so it shows um, elements as nodes and then their relationships as, um, as edges. And it has um, these structure diagrams, which uh, show static information, and then behavior diagrams, which show um, in, um, sort of uh, dynamic information. And um, one important design decision for UML was um, it's only one color, because it should be drawable with just one pen. Um, there was, and, and with that design decision, of course, they miss out on the whole aspect of coloring uh, things to convey meaning, but um, that, was th that was the design decision. And uh, UML was also never really uh, implemented, uh, developed to, um, to be used on the whole software system. It was just made to cover specific um, interesting aspects of it. And a lot of people misused it and built like diagrams with hundreds of nodes and then it became a mess. And, and so um, UML sort of also became, uh, 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 got a bad reputation, but that was never the intention of UML. And the specification um, was um, extended over the last years, there's new standards, and it became really powerful, but that also has a downside because now the notation is so expressive that as a user, you, you really need to know what you're doing. You need to know all these notational elements. Um, which is also a downside. Um, all right, let's look at some other stuff. So for <coughs> other structure examples, um, first of all, I want to show a DoxyGen. So DoxyGen is a um, documentation reference um, software, so it generates a documentation. And it also provides these, um, for classes, these um, nice diagrams that show inheritance relationships. So they're a little interactive, so you can also click on them and select others. And then below they show um, collaboration diagrams. And in the legend, we can see that, um, so blue is the usual inheritance. And these purple dashed <coughs> edges, they convey that uh, a class is instantiating uh, another type. And so, in the collaboration diagram, they sort of try to um, to show these relationships um, regarding to the type and its base class. Um, so, but it's it's a really simple thing. But if you're new to a software project, this can be really helpful because often the class hierarchy is um, like a first step to understand what what how the architecture works. Um, a couple of years ago, Visual Studio um, added a feature named Code Maps and uh, it's available in their enterprise version. Um, and they basically have two approaches of using it. One is you um, start at the top at your executables, and then you go on and expand. So you can have these areas, and you expand them, and then you see their, their members. So you can see all classes in, in one of your uh, modules. And then you can, you can also look at uh, which dependencies these elements have to each other. And you can go down to method and field level. And so one way for them, uh, they added to avoid clutter is they added um, a way of filtering what you want to see. <coughs> and um, then there's the second approach, which is you start at somewhere in your code. And then you can, from your context menu, say, show this element like this method in the code map. and then. In the code map, you can um, like add more things to it, like say all things referenced by this method or all things referencing this method. And so you can build up like a, a map of something you're currently interested in. Um, then um, there's a tool named CPP Depend, and they also have dependency graphs, but for because that can become a little messy, they came up with um, with a, another way to represent it, in uh, so they they have this adjacency matrix visualization where you um, each node is um, has a row and a column, and 
where column and row cross, you see how many de dependencies go from one <coughs> node to the other. And that way you can select graphs, but also you can use the mathematical properties of an adjacency matrix and you can, um, for example, you can find paths between node A and node B or by multiplying with itself you can um, see where you have uh, cycles in your dependencies. And that's an interesting way of doing that. Um, and they have, um, so <coughs> CPPDPAM provides a lot of metrics and to actually show what um, of like how that metric turns out in your code base, they have this tree visualization. Um, and so that takes the whole code base and assigns like um, areas depending on the lines of code in a file, for example. And then um, they, the area is subdivided based on this size metric. And then with colors, they convey which areas are affected by some metric. All right, so those were examples for structure visualization. Uh, let's go quickly into behavior visualization. Um, you probably know um, like these um, algorithm visualizations for teaching. Those are an example for that. So for example, here we have um, a quick sort algorithm visualized on this page, Visual Algo. Um, so how it works is it um, shows the state the states while the algorithm <coughs> is doing his work. And to show you what the algorithm does, they use colors. So they, you know, they, the pivot gets yellow and then um, with that, they sort of convey what it does. And they also use motion. So when the state changes, they, they uh, show you what switches and that makes it easier to follow. Um, but, <coughs> Behavior visualization can also be um, other data collected during runtime, not, not only what an algorithm does. Um, so it can also be time measurements. And in the Chrome browser, there's a tool named Tracing. And with that, you can, um, you can collect time measurements that are all spread over the, the Chrome code base. So for example, if we have this animate a little, and then stop. <coughs> um, then uh, the Chrome Trace View provides this um, flame chart visualization of what happened. Like here, you can see like um, it's like stacks. It's stacked on uh, how long a method took, and it sums up how long the, the methods um, called by this method took. And so, so you can easily see um, where time is spent in your code base. The thing is you need to sort of um, add all these events or there's profilers that just do it for the whole call stack, but then like the graph <coughs> can be really big. So for the Chrome team, it worked out the best if they de define which methods they want to see in there and, and which shouldn't be in there. All right. <coughs> then some uh, examples on evolution. Um, one thing that you probably all know is uh, the um, visualization of um, Git branches. <coughs> so with Git log graph one line, you can see from a repository like which branches, um, where they leave and where they enter again. The asterisk shows where um, um, like the line of the commit and then they use colors to convey which, uh, what's the different branches. And it's also interesting that the, the lines are just pipes and, and slashes and so they use continuation to sort of make you see lines. Um, but there's also Git based tools that do this in a little nicer way like uh, smart Git or GitLab. Um, close. And <coughs> CPP depend also provides a way of um, seeing how metrics develop over time and they do this with line charts. That is also a way of evo uh, visualizing the evolution of, uh, of a code base. All right. Um, so now we saw some examples. Now let's get, ba get back to our reading example. Um, so if we want to make it easier to um, see what's in this code, we have to think about how to visualize it. And what, first of all, what do we want to see? So 
We're interested in, you know, what do we do when we read it? We um, find things that, uh, like definitions of something and see where it's used. So pretty much we want to see the symbols and their dependencies. Um, <coughs> so it sounds like graph visualization. And then we just need to assign like what, what will be our nodes and what will be our edges. So we, we just say types, functions, and variables are the nodes and their relationships, inheritance, <coughs> specialization, call, access, that will be the, 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 uh, the, no, uh, the edges. And so one simple way of um, coming up with a notation for the nodes is we just use different colors. We make types gray and functions yellow and variables blue. And if we have a class that has members, then we just use containment and put them inside so we see um, those are the children. Okay, and for edges, we just reuse the same colors. So if a variable is accessed, we use blue. If a function is called yellow, when a type is used, then gray. Um, and for inheritance, we can use the um, big arrow that we know from UML. Um, templates are a little trickier because here the compiler generates code um, for the template class um, depending on the argument type. And so for the visualization, it turns out it's um, the simplest thing if we, do, if we do the same and we add sort of a, a, a template specialization node that doesn't really exist in the code that binds together the template class and the type that is used as argument. Okay, and so if we apply this notation to our little sample, it results in this visualization. And with, uh, with this visualization, you can now see like everything in gray, those are the types, everything in yellow, that's um, all the functional things and, and with the edges, the whole call graph and the blue things are the state and where it's accessed. And so these two representations, they, they have their um, pros and cons. Let's look into it. So the source code, is all the information. It, um, it's the ground truth. And we are familiar with it because we write it. And, but it, it has like the, the, the bad thing about it is a code base tends to be like large amounts of data. And if we look for something very specific in it, like we might easily miss it or uh, have <coughs> to search a lot. And if we look at just some, just one feature, the information for this one might be spread across like lots of locations. And um, as I said, the reading part is slower to process. Um, then the visualization, it um, can give you a quick overview. It um, brings information from different places together and it shows the dependencies. But it, it, it's just like a summary. It, there's a lot of information mi missing. Like you really can't tell much about the, uh, the implementation from this. And it, depending on how many symbols you show, it can be really cluttered. And you, first of all, you need to learn how this notation works. So in the end, the best thing would be if we could use the advantages of both of them and combine them. Um, and of course, like the big question is, can, does a notation like this really work in uh, real life? Like if you're on a decent sized code base and that's sort of the questions we try to answer with uh, source trail. Um, now, the first problem is how do you get the data? And for that, luckily there's uh, the libtooling library of the LLVM Clang frontend. And for that you can, um, it um, generates abstract syntax trees and then you can implement your own AST visitor and pick out all the information you want and store it. And that way, you get all the data. And then the thing is, how do you represent it? Um, for that, we have a UI that, as mentioned, has a visualization and the code. And uh, it, that is complemented with a search feature, so you um, find everything in the code base real quick. Um, actually, the, the whole user in interface is now really close to a web browser. So more a web browser than a, uh, than a code editor now, which um, makes it actually really familiar in terms of interaction. Okay, and with that, I want to show you some, uh, uh, show you a demo and talk a little bit more about what the challenges are in actually realizing this concept. Okay.
All right, so um, I'm going to start with some really simple sample project, uh, which is um, rather small. It has 500 lines of code. And so we have um, this overview that shows you all the symbols that exist. Like, so first of all, you have to index your project. Um, and after that, you see these lists of different types of symbols. We don't have like an overarching map of the whole project yet. Um, we get requests for that a lot, but I will try to look into it soon, but it's, um, you have to be careful to not create something that just looks messy. Um, you want something that looks useful. Um, and so um, the real um, use case um, that Source Trail is working on starts as soon as you activate the symbol. So for example, it's the main function, and if you activate the symbol, then you see um, a visualization of its dependencies in the graph, and you see the code. So the definition of it in the in the uh, code view, and now this is interactive. So you can just click on anything in the graph or on anything in the code, and both will simultaneously update. And you can also click on um, edges, and that will show you where this exact dependency is happening in the code. Okay, now because classes tend to have a lot of members, <coughs> we um, collapse them. We only show the currently connected symbols. For example, this class has a lot more members that we usually don't show. If we would show all the members all the time, then um, there would be way too much information. So we cut it down. Um, the good thing is I already explained you what the colors mean. Um, types in gray, <coughs> functions in yellow, um, variables in blue. But there's also um, the position of these elements is also important. So we um, we put all the, um, so we put the, the active symbol that you currently look at in the middle, we um, put the ones that use this symbol on the, on the right and on the left, uh, on the left. And on the right you will see all the, um, the symbols used by the currently active one. And for, um, for inheritance relationships, we um, position base, base classes at the top and derive ones at the bottom. And that way, if you activate the class, you can uh, immediately <coughs> sort of see um, where does it derive from, what is derived from it, who is using it, and who is used by this class. Um, now there's also these light gray edges. I haven't explained those yet. They are combining um, edges between the children of these classes. So if I click on it, I can see what of the API of the player class is used by the tic-tac-toe class. And that's a really great way if you're refactoring some class and you want to see which class actually uses what, uh, which parts of a public API of it. Um, okay, now let's take a look at some um, bigger code base. So for example, um, the Cinder library. Um, so Cinder is a C++ application framework for creating uh, like creative for creative coding so you can do 2d and 3d graphics and sound and so it's used a lot in art installations and that kind of thing um, so first of all we see we have some um, new symbol types here there's like type defs and enums for these types of um, symbols we we did not introduce new colors because that would just clutter the whole thing it, there's more colors to remember now so instead, we, we use some um, icons. And these symbols tend not to be as common as classes and um, structs. So um, it does not add a lot of clutter. And as soon as you, as you sort of um, remember which icon means what, then <coughs> you're really fast in recognizing it. Um, so one enum is attribute type. OK. Now, another problem is. Um, there can be symbols that are just referenced a lot in your code base. And so when first activating the symbol and showing the graph, we, um, at, some, at a certain point, we bundle information together. Like all referencing symbols, <coughs> we bundle them, and only if you're interested in that part, um, you can expand it. And so um, in lots of other tools, showing this type of graph with a lot of uh, notes becomes really messy. Um, so instead of drawing you know, lines with um, 
splines, we decided to um, use this approach and have them fall together on the same line. And with that, um, it becomes really structured. Of course, that has a downside. Like usually, um, you shouldn't do that because it's sort of, um, the user can't see anymore where, which line is going. But in our case, we already know that all of the edges are going to our active symbol. So for, for this use case, it works really well. Um, the only problem is what if you have different types of edges? So for example, if I look at this function, then I see it has lots of uh, type views, variable accesses and other calls. And for that, we, um, we use a little offset so you can still see where, um, which type of edge is going. Um, okay, then you've probably seen there's a bundle named non-index symbols. So what are non-index symbols? Technically, if we, um, we have the whole um, abstract syntax tree when doing our indexing. And that includes all the standard headers and all library code that you use in your source code. But if you put all of that in your index and you show all, the all of that information all the time, it, 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 it clutters the whole thing because you're usually not interested in that stuff. You're, you're interested in your own code and how, it, um, how the symbols connect together. And so what we do is we only, we only um, index the definitions of um, of symbols that are within the project directory and all the stuff that is within headers that are included from outside is, um, is not directly indexed, but if it's used somewhere in your source code, then you can still see it. So for example, here I have a share pointer on um, this uh, buffer object. And if I activate it, I can see um, all the symbols reference in this type of share pointer. Um, but I don't have a definition of the share, uh, like the, the code defining the share pointer in the, uh, in the code view. Um, okay, next let's take a look at um, some inheritance relationships. Okay, so this <coughs> cylinder class is, um, has um, the source class as base and with uh, activating this um, aggregation, we can see all the dependent symbols in the derived class. And now we have these new purple edges that I haven't explained yet. Um, those are override edges, which mean, yeah, you get the point. So I, if I activate get primitive, I can see that it, it um, overrides the get primitive in the, so in the source class. And I can see that there's no call going to cylinder get primitive. And of course, there's probably is some call using this um, thing, but it's in the base class because as you probably thought, um, this is a pure virtual method. And so at this point, there's a V table lookup. With um, static analysis, we can't figure out which of the overridden methods is actually called at this point. So in the visualization, we can only show you um, there's potentially all of these will be called. And for this use case of looking at um, inheritance, um, where you potentially have lots of classes. We um, also implemented a different way of graph visualization, which is here on the top left. I'm not sure if you can see it, but you can pretty much generate uh, the whole inheritance tree for a certain class, um, which is a nice way of getting an overview. Uh, okay, then, um, um, oh yeah, okay. um, I haven't talked about namespaces yet. So all of this code is namespaced. Um, like Cinder uses some um, nested namespaces and the problem is if, if we add the namespace to the name, then we would have like lots of clutter everywhere. Like each of these symbols just had to s has the same namespace. So instead of showing it everywhere, we just show it uh, by hovering this small triangle in the front. And then you can also activate it and see all the things defined in the namespace. But some users might prefer to see the namespace information. And so we optionally allow that you draw, <coughs> um, draw these areas that uh, show you to which namespace things belong. 
Um, and you can also, um, instead of namespaces, show this on a file level. So you can see um, in which file certain symbols were defined. This is um, in an object-oriented um, code base, this is not as important. But if you're like in a C code base or a functional style code base, then often the file provides a lot of important context information. Um, and otherwise, you would just have in our graph um, functions floating around, which, you know, in that sense, is not that helpful. Um, all right. Um, then one more thing I want to show is templates. But for templates, I'm going to switch to uh, the Clang project because it um, shows better examples. All right, so in uh, Clang, we have this, what was it called? AST decal. There's this AST decal class, which is a template. Uh, and so what we do is we, um, with from the AST, we can take all information about which, um, which <coughs> types are used as type arguments to specialize a certain template. And we save that information and we can show it to you. So you can see that these are all the specializations of the AST decal uh, class. And if you activate one of these nodes, um, you can see at the top the template class and somewhere on the right there is um, the type that was used for specializing it. And you can also see where this template then is used. This template is actually used, this specialization is used as um, as a template argument for another template. And we can look at all the, of the specializations of that symbol as well. And here we actually still have some problems. I'm not too happy with that because template name, names get to, they, they, turn, uh, they can get really long. And if we show the whole um, name of them in the graph, then it, um, it just creates a lot of clutter. But actually, if you're looking at that, what you're actually probably more interested is in is, is just seeing um, the, template, the template arguments and not so much seeing um, like the class names. So I think there's still some optimization we can do. Um, OK, and with that, <coughs> I'm already at the end of my demo. And actually, my original thought was I wanted to give some out view at the end of the talk, like where software visualization might go, what would be some crazy ideas. Like one thing I can see is that, um, so right now the tools are really, um, they define the notation for you. Maybe it would be an interesting way to just provide the data and means of visualization. So you, you can define your own notation, like how you wanna represent classes or specializations or whatever. And um, but not sure if, 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 if that's a valid way to go and if users would, would want to use that because usually most users just want something that works out of the box. That's just, you open it and it, it's helpful. Um, so um, the thing with visualizations is you, you really have to um, think about what use case you have what problem you want to solve and if the visualization really fits, um, like solves the problem you're looking at. And um, the problem with building good visualizations is you, you really have some challenges. You need to uh, collect good data and then you need to find a good representation and then it has to be easy to use and there needs to be interaction and filtering so the user can see what he wants to see. Um, but yeah, with that, I hope I gave you like a good overview of the field of software visualization and like the fundamentals of um, why it um, why it can help you in understanding information faster. And um, I thank you for being here. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's a good point, yeah. So actually, currently, we just take 
the whole template name the way we get it from the compiler and we would actually you know split it up into its pieces and then um, process them separately that's probably a good <coughs> approach yeah uh, you just showed that you switched over to different uh, workspaces or projects um, but you just opened uh, a workspace or it has to be imported first right so it will also take some time to index this or yes so, so just moved over to <coughs> something that was already indexed. Yeah, of course. I index the projects and then it's easy to open. Um, the indexer, because it's Clang based, it takes um, it takes like around the same time as compiling. So, um, but usually it's not that um, important that you always have like the latest index. Like a lot of times I just have index of my master branch and that works nice as well. Yes. So, so the question was if we use other things than size, color, and yeah. position. Um, actually, I can't think of something currently. <laughs> yes? So are the fonts for size adjustable in that tool? Yes. <coughs> Uh, so the question was, is the font size adjustable? Yes, it is. Um, but the, the code view is just um, for displaying code. You can't edit anything. Yes? So this still seems very uh, like software structure oriented, helping with your, your, your classes and your functions and stuff. Uh, I've actually done, unfortunately, a fair bit of coding in LabVIEW, which is a rather extreme way to visualize code. but it's fundamentally different. The, the visualization of the execution or a variable is a line, and the length of the line is the life of that variable sort of thing. So is there any plans or capability to do that with something like this? Um, so the question was if um, we also plan to do dynamic visualization, like, for example, information doing a debugger run. Um, at the moment, we don't plan on doing that because um, it's it's a different use case and also you you sort of have to actually you would have to redo the whole thing like the way of collecting data is different the visualization you do is different and the user interface would probably be different as well yeah okay, um, that's all the questions, I think. all right thank you